My name is Dr. Ina Park. I'm a professor at the University of California, San Francisco School of Medicine in the Department of Family and Community Medicine and Obstetrics and Gynecology. I'm also a medical consultant for the Division of STD Prevention at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the medical director of the California Prevention Training Center. So as you can see, I wear many hats. In my university role, I actually have research teams that I manage and we're looking at the impact of HPV vaccine on a population level at pre-cancer and cancer incidence. In my role as medical director of the California Prevention Training Center, I spend a lot of time educating folks on STD diagnosis and treatment. In my role at the CDC, I spend a lot of time writing national guidelines on STD diagnosis and treatment with a particular focus on syphilis diagnosis. So my field is rife with misinformation because it is such a taboo subject. And even starting with the terminology that we use, some of you may remember that the term for sexually transmitted infection used to be venereal disease. And that term venereal comes from the word venery, which implies that some sort of immoral behavior is involved. And there's our first piece of misinformation because we know actually that sexually transmitted infections it can happen to anyone, even if they're in the confines of a monogamous relationship. And so we started off with VD or venereal disease and then quickly moved on in the 70s to the term sexually transmitted disease or STD and that term is not inaccurate because many sexually transmitted infections actually do cause disease but there are many others where they just cause a silent infection which is why we refer to them as STIs or sexually transmitted infections. So while in my field, we often use the terms STD and STI interchangeably, STI is more scientifically accurate and it is definitely the direction that the field is moving in because STI is thought to be less stigmatizing for those who are living with these infections. Even with the ubiquity of STIs, people are still so reluctant to talk about them. And I think a lot of people are misinformed that STIs are some sort of punishment for sexual immorality. And that actually harkens back to the Bible where things like STIs were thought to be God's punishment for fornicating outside of the confines of a heterosexual marriage. So not only with the sentiments in the Bible, but throughout history in the United States during both World War I and World War II, where there was a plethora of propaganda posters that touted the effects of STIs on soldiers, as well as blaming and shaming them for catching an STI. Stigma has been propagated throughout our society here in the US. So now we are in a situation where it is much easier to have sex than to actually talk about sex. In particular, its least pleasant consequences, such as STIs. I think one of the most important ways to counter the misinformation and stigma that exists around STIs out there is to understand the concept of sexual networks and how they're related to your risk of catching an STI. One of the most common myths in my field is that STIs are directly related to the number of partners you have sex with. That's actually not the case. So the absolute number of partners does play some role, but in fact, how you connect with partners in space and time is actually more important. So if you have concurrent partners, where you go back and forth in a short period of time between partners, that's actually much more likely to spread an STI or HIV than if you have partners in a serial monogamous fashion. Even people that report having just one partner can have very different levels of risk because if the person's partner was in a high risk sexual network and had many sexual connections before coming to their current relationship, they're obviously going to confer a different level of risk than somebody who wasn't in a relationship for the few months before they entered a new partnership. So another area where misinformation has flourished is on the subject of HPV vaccination. By propagating and publishing fraudulent data on multiple anti-vaccine websites, anti-vaxxers are discouraging folks from getting the HPV vaccine. And that has had the effect that HPV vaccine is one that has not taken hold in the US population the way other vaccines have. After over 100 million doses of HPV vaccine being distributed and 270 million worldwide, there's been no connection between HPV vaccine and any adverse events that we know of. So one other area where there's been a lot of misunderstanding is in the area of HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. And I think many of us have just felt like, well, it's a home run for HIV prevention, which it is. But I think there's a sentiment out there that once you're on PrEP, you can just throw condoms out the window. And the truth is, is that we are at an all-time high for reported STIs to the CDC, and one of the reasons is that folks who are taking PrEP are less likely to use barriers such as condoms. We can't just throw condoms out the window if we want to get a handle on the current STI epidemic. One of the other areas of misinformation or misunderstanding that's out there 
actually has implications that go far beyond the field of STIs, and that's in the misuse of antibiotics. So one of the downstream effects of antibiotic misuse for the common cold, for which antibiotics have no efficacy, is that we've lost the ability to use drugs such as azithromycin for the treatment of gonorrhea due to increases in antibiotic resistance. Freshers, a walk through the woods on an early spring morning. Freshers, a gentle breeze that takes you by surprise. Fresh is simple with summer's eve. I think one of the most nefarious misinformation industries out there is really what I call vaginal hygiene snake oil peddlers. And there's obviously a multi-billion dollar industry related to vaginal hygiene products. Even from the 1950s, when folks were encouraged to use Lysol to douche out their vagina, folks in the vaginal hygiene industry have been stating to women that your vagina is not good enough as is and that you should be putting chemicals in them, which we know destroys the vaginal microbiome and actually makes women more likely to contract things like HIV as well as get infections such as bacterial vaginosis. Nevertheless, a very thriving industry of powders, creams, gels, and perfumes continues to flourish. So one piece of advice I have for viewers, if someone's trying to sell you something, that information cannot be without bias. So I actually wrote a book about this called Strange Bedfellows, and in the conduct of my research for the book, I learned so many different ways that STIs have influenced our society everywhere from incredible loss of soldiers during World War I to syphilis and gonorrhea, all the way to the conduct of human subjects research as a result of the abuses during the Tuskegee experiment, to reality TV and selections of contestants for The Bachelor. So as you can see, even though we don't talk about them and we don't see them very easily, STIs play an incredibly important role in our lives. So a lot of folks ask me why I chose the field of STIs to devote my career to, and the truth is, is it's not something that as a little girl one says, oh, I want to become an STI researcher when I grow up. But when I got to college and I started counseling people post-STI diagnosis as a peer educator, I began to realize how incredibly common these infections are. And in fact, they're ubiquitous. Basically, every sexually active person is going to get an STI at some point. And so given both how ubiquitous and also how taboo these infections were, you know, definitely drew my interest into trying to destigmatize and normalize these infections, as well as delve into the science and understand better how these bugs affect our lives and societies. So I was a AAAS Leshner Fellow, which focused on training in public engagement. And during that fellowship, I learned some concrete skills that have helped me counter the misinformation that exists out there in my field one of which was learning how to use social media, and the second of which was learning how to write opinion pieces. And both of those are platforms from which you can counter misinformation with good, solid, evidence-based information. So I think with all the misinformation that is out there on the internet, it's hard to know who to trust for sexual health information. And when it comes to STIs, I feel like the CDC's website is very reliable, reputable, and evidence-based. I think if you're a sexually active person who wants more information, the American Sexual Health Association has great information as well. So obviously COVID is the infectious disease of the moment. And I have to say that COVID had a huge effect on our field as well. I think certainly after people went into shelter in place, they were having less sex, they were having less partners, and we certainly saw a decline in STIs in the second quarter of 2020. But unfortunately, they have come back with a vengeance. So while I'm certainly not discouraging folks from having sex, people need to keep their guard up and realize that STIs never went away and they certainly are not going anywhere. So my call to action for those of you out there who are watching who actually do patient care is when it comes to things like HPV vaccine, anti-vaccine sentiment, that we need to counter the stories that people are reading online with our own stories. So share the stories of your other patients and negative outcomes that they've gone through because they weren't vaccinated. Share the information that you got your own family vaccinated because those personal narratives go a long way in countering things that folks read online. And when they come from a trusted source such as yourself, they are more likely to sway patients than something that they might read on a government website. For anyone else out there who's consuming information related to sexual health, check your information for biases. And if the information is coming from someone who's trying to sell you something, 
by default, it cannot be completely unbiased.